obviously the the the, the Kobe news yesterday uh, 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 was uh, a sad day in in society, not just sports. Um, um, you know, and 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 I I felt that uh, my oldest was home for for a day, and uh, he's you know like all kids his age, they're tied into social media 24 hours a day, and and. Uh, um, I was actually driving home from Jennifer Scott's service, and, and he called, uh, losing his mind. And um, you know, when he was five years old, I bought him a Kobe Bryant jersey, and um, and so he was a huge Kobe Bryant fan, and and seeing his pain, and and you know, just. Uh, uh, you know, it's unfortunate, and and. Uh, for me, then, once I started kind of reflecting, what, what hurt me the most was he was one of the people that I was really, really dying to meet uh, through basketball, or because of basketball, I should say. Uh, but uh, talk about somebody that was impacting society um, in an incredible way. Um, what he was doing for homelessness situation in Los Angeles, um, uh, just speaks volumes for who he, you know, who he is and who he was, and um, uh, the mentoring ship. Look, look at the great competitors that are either close to retiring or going to retire. Uh, that were all his young teammates in the Olympics 12 years ago, whatever it was. Um, the fuel to compete, uh, the to dr the drive uh, to to win uh, that he shared with anyone that was his teammate uh, that was worth a salt as a competitor is something that they never forgot. And all you got to do is just go through it. I mean, whether it's LeBron or D Wade or you know all that next group of guys that once he was on his tail end were taking over the NBA. Uh, what a mentor he was to them, and um, uh, contrary to uh, uh, the belief of uh, today's society, which is unfortunate because uh, 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 today's society protects who leaks stuff to the media and and who's active on social media um, with the privacy of locker rooms. Um, Kobe's one of the great teammates, uh, one of the. You know, great teammates aren't the nice guys. Great teammates are the ones that uplift everyone and, and, and take on the responsibility of the good and the bad days and then keep everything private and, um, and challenge people to do more. And uh, uh, we need more teammates like Kobe Bryant in today's society. While we're on the topic of, of Kobe, you, you said you really wanted to meet him. When, when did that come about? Was it because initially because of his basketball, or was it later because of of, of the other things you mentioned off the court? Yeah, I mean, you know, 1996, 1997, uh, when uh, that's right when he was a high school senior, right in there somewhere. I was still coaching high school basketball, and um, so I was working all the camps and. And the whole argument back then was who was the best player, him or Lester Earl, that ended up at LSU. And uh, so, you know, I didn't know any of those guys. And, uh, you know, but that's, that was the whole argument back then. And, and, and then, you know, he came into the league and he, and he was so brash and so aggressive. And, um, you know, and then he went to the Lakers, which is not a team that I rooted for as a kid. Uh, so right away he became villain number one for me, uh, and uh, and then he won, and he take an average player and help him play great. Um, then I started getting older, and the older I got, the more my f being a fan went out the window, and the more I started to kind of understand how the world works. So the more respect I had for how unbelievable. It uh, what an unbelievable competitor he was, but the way he, uh, the way he just made people better. He he made his teammates better. He made the opponents better. He made 
Uh, the officials officiate better. He made fans pay attention and root harder, whether you rooted for him or rooted against him. There's not a whole lot of people like that. I think when you hear, I think it was Doc Rivers who said, not too many people have that DNA. That's, that's what I took from Doc's comment yesterday. Um, so, uh, you know, as he was going through his journey as a player, I continued to, uh, to, to just gain more and more respect. And then, uh, like I tell you guys, I don't want to be remembered whenever my time to get away from all this for my wins and losses. If that's what I'm remembered for, I've lived a sad life. Uh, who he was becoming for young people, uh, that level of competitiveness that he had to uplift people while he was playing, now he was using it for life. And uh, that's what it's about, man. It's about impacting people uh, in a positive way uh, to, to get them to aspire to do more and, and give them hope. And that's what he was doing. And that's now as a man now, you know, old 53-year-old man, that's, that's what I kind of look forward to. And, and guys that do what he did, um, uh, we need more of that in this world. Uh, you, you know, his smile, his his character, his uh, his enthusiasm to help, uh, to compete. Uh, we we don't have enough of that. We need more. We we I, I hope who he was in in his short life. Uh, uh, I hope it permeates, and 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 we can use this moment to understand his greatness and, and how he impacted people. Frank, uh, looking ahead to Wednesday's game, you've been to Walton Arena a few times mm -hmm. now. What makes it so tough to win out there besides the talent of the opposing team? 17,000 people are waiting for you when you walk on the court to shoot warm-up shots. They're just sitting there and, you know, your guys walk out and they're going to go shoot some balls and the arena's going nuts already. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's uh, uh, you know, they, they, they – Home court environments are not just about 10 minutes ago in the game. Home court environments are an hour before the game. They have that. Um, and uh, uh, so that, that, that makes it a challenge because your players, once the game starts, the fans are out the window. But that energy that you feel as an opposing player when you walk into a building an hour before the game and they're already there, uh, that can impact the team. That's where the home court environment kicks in. And, and that can impact the team, and, and especially young players. Now, for, uh, for us, we, we've, we've played a bunch of road games. Uh, we've been fortunate. We've had success in, in, in a handful of them. Uh, so I, I, I hope it doesn't impact us. It did at Auburn. It did. We, we, we were uh, – uh, we, the, the game was impacted by the energy in the building at Auburn. Um, but uh, uh, but then the second part to that is they got their whole team back, and you know anytime you return your whole team, and then Moss is Moss is real similar to to Mike. Um, you know if Moss was a two three zone passive kind of play slow coach, then I can see where there'd be an adjustment period. Or if Mike was that way, but they're very similar with how they play. They're very aggressive offensive teams. Uh, very aggressive defensive teams. So style of coaching, even though it's new, fits the personnel that have been recruited. And you've got a group of guys. You know, they were good last year. Like, you know, it's not like, you know, they were good last year. So Muss has done a great job of, of uh, um, uh, you know, of, of sustaining that confidence that those kids had last year. And, and they're all back. So, you know, Mason Jones, uh, Harris, Joe, they were able to get Jimmy Witt back, who obviously played there uh, before. And, and, you know, Jimmy Witt's basically been, what is it, two years at SMU and now two at our, a four year starter. So it's, um, it, it they're, they're, they got tremendous depth. Uh, you know, I started breaking them down last night, and, you know, my guy Harris. I was like, he's still there. I didn't realize he was back too. I, for whatever reason, and you know, he had one of the most powerful dunks I've ever seen last year on Mike Kotar's head in this building. So uh, maybe he can dunk on him real hard again, see if he can wake up. It's, Mike's taken a nap for the last three games, but um, um, I, they got good players, and it's a great, great home court. 
Frank, I think of your player connections with Kobe, Steve Blake is one guy that, yeah. that played for him. And mm -hmm. I saw where when, when Steve got traded from the Lakers, Kobe mm -hmm. was vocal about how he didn't like it. He wanted, he wanted Steve Blake to stay there because he, he obviously fit what Kobe wanted mm -hmm. in a teammate. As a former coach of Steve's, did that, is that a, and talking about the way you talk about Kobe now, was that a prideful thing mm -hmm. to know that one of your former guys had, had matched the intensity level that Kobe wanted? That's uh, the, the um, what do you call that? Third degree of separation? Is that, is that sixth degree of separation? Is that accurate for what you're asking me? Like the kind of my take of what Kobe was like behind the scenes through some other avenue? Steve's very private. It's, and I don't call Steve's, hey, what's he like? Tell me, tell me. But I knew that Steve had unbelievable respect for Kobe Bryant. And I know what Steve's all about. Steve don't respect people that are bad teammates. Steve don't respect people that are non-competitive. Uh, so just by me knowing Steve and knowing how much he respected Kobe, that said a lot to me. And uh, when we, when 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 I go, it's part of our recruiting uh, portfolio that we use when we recruit. And if I'm recruiting you and you're a point guard, and I'm showing you some of the point guards that I've been fortunate to be around in my career, Steve's one of them. And I use a quote by Kobe Bryant about Steve Blake. And Kobe, I'm not going to go through the whole quote, but basically the essence of the quote was how disappointed he was that Steve's being traded. And he calls Steve, that's my psycho competitor. Those are Kobe's words about Steve. And, uh, and then there's another guy named Mike Procopio who um, uh, was a, uh, a young workout guy uh, that used to work out of the gym in Chicago uh, with, uh, uh, oh, my God, I can't believe I forgot his name. It's the, uh, Michael Jordan's personal trainer started that own facility. Oh, my God. His name will come to me. But Kobe got word that he's really good with footwork. Mike is a phenomenal footwork teacher. He ended up working for the Dallas Mavericks. He, this is his first year out of the NBA in a while. And what allowed him to get into the NBA was Kobe. And, and Kobe basically hired him to be his personal advanced scout for the games he was getting ready to play. So Mike would watch his next three opponents and break down film of what moves would work against the guys that are going to guard him. And, and that's, that's how much, as great as Kobe was, that's the thing about the great ones, man. They're always looking for more information. They're always looking for more help. And anyone that could help them, they're like a sponge. And, and, and then because of the way Steve felt about, you know, the respect Steve had for Kobe, um, that's why those two avenues are the two personal deals, why I was so excited about one day getting in front of him. And, and I've been, you know, this game has allowed me to meet so many incredible people and, and he was the one that I actually wanted to make sure I met. And, uh, uh, you know, that'll be a void that uh, uh, I'll never recover from. Coach, back here, uh, have you spoken to your team? I, I remember yesterday Dawn Staley having to talk to her team after mm -hmm. the game. The, the girls were very emotional. What have you heard from your guys? And just how do you kind of make sense of this all for them so they can get their mind right for Wednesday? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing that. Uh, a little later on today, I, I don't think those are conversations that I should be having through text messages. Or uh, and yesterday is our day off, so I'm technically not allowed to have a team meeting. Um, 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 but based on seeing my son, who's a peer of my players, how he was impacted by a guy he had never met, it's it's something that we're going to do later on today. It's something that. Uh, um, um, you know, I, uh, I, I've kind of read some of the stuff some of the, our guys have put on social media, uh, and uh, that, that's that's the part. It, it, his greatness wasn't just about the points and the championships; it was about who he was and what he was about. And and that's why when I tell people all the time, and they think I'm out of my mind because you know we're hard driving and all the, the good ones. I don't care how old they are. That's that's where they migrate to. Competitive, hard-working, hard-driving people, and and uh, it's no surprise that 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 Kobe was idolized and, and celebrated by so many, uh, including 
the teenage guys that that supposedly don't like to work because that's kind of you know anyone that works and, and forces people to work in today's day and age we frown on them they're a bad teammate they're they're ah, that coach don't fit who we are you know society's different times have changed let me tell you something nothing's changed I, I think Nick Saban said it best people want to succeed uh, stay away from lazy people, and lazy people stay away from people who want to succeed, and that's no different in 1950 than what it is today. But yes, I will visit with our players today about that. I, I think I think it's important that I hear uh, what our guys have to say and how it impacts them. Frank, a two-parter here. Uh, you mentioned Jimmy Witt, and now he's come back. He's really got that mid-range jump shot working. You got Arkansas down packed, don't you? <laughs> Holy cow, you should have called me last night. We could have shared notes. I'll do that go next ahead, time. Go ahead, but, uh, go ahead, go ahead. You know, how tough is that to defend? And also with Joe, he missed last game. I think he's got a bad knee. Do you guys expect him to play? How do you defend uh, or how do you prepare as if he might not play? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer the second part, the Joe part, because it's unknown to me. I, I, I know he's an elite level shooter. Uh, uh, and, and, and when you play on a team that has so much aggressive downhill guard play as they do, uh, it's going to create open threes for you. Uh, his threes this year are a little different than last year because they don't have that low post score offensive rebounder uh, that um, uh, Daniel uh, Gafford was for them. Um, but still, they offensive rebound, and uh, but they, 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 uh, they're getting his threes more off uh, – the fact that they've all played together now. They, they understand each other. Uh, so I don't know if he's going to play or not. Um, on um, uh, your first question, uh, they're playing Jimmy Witt at the four a lot. Uh, so he's been matched up against bigger players, and, and then he plays um, from that 15, 17-foot mark. Uh, and he, he, he's not really at the rim. Uh, and he's not really – he's not I – I think he's attempted 1-3 all year. Um, but he's, he's trying to play off the bounds to like 12, 14 feet, and he's automatic when he can get to that spot. Uh, so we, we have to be uh, very careful with our assignment on him. Uh, he he uh, uh, Even though they don't score on post-ups, he gives them a lot of that so-called – you know what everyone says doesn't work anymore, mid-range – he is phenomenal from that spot, um, and uh, so, um, and he's really good at it. And he's a fifth-year guy, so he, he's he's at peace with who he is, and uh, um, so it's um, he, he's he's a problem. Questions for me? Kind of a little bit off topic, but seventh, um, how's he kind of handled this year? I guess halfway through it, and kind of how does. You talked a lot about personality. How does going against him maybe every day in scout team or whatever make Jermaine and, and Trey and AJ kind of better? Yeah, no doubt. It's uh, Jermaine. We're making Jermaine guard him every single day in practice. And we make Trey Hannibal guard him every single day in practice. And I probably need to make other guys guard him every day in practice because maybe that's why those are our two best on-ball perimeter defenders right now. Uh, but seven's been great. Um, he He's... Uh, He's worked really hard at, at, uh, at reworking his jump shot. Uh, he, he uh, for whatever reason, um, you know, and I'll let him one day address it. I, uh, it's not my place to address it, but he kind of changed his technique. And, um, and, and I, it, it, it wasn't very good. Uh, just no other way to explain it. And he's, he's worked, Chuck Martin's helped him a lot. And he's put in an unbelievable amount of time and, and his jump shot is starting to look pretty, pretty good again. Uh, but with him, like I told you guys before the year, I've been very hands off with him because uh, he's been in that fishbowl basically his whole life. <clears throat> and when I mean hands off, I don't mean like I've ignored him. I'm just not trying to pressure him to do certain things. I just want him to regain confidence in who he is and, and that joy of competing and playing. He, he was lacking there last year. When, when he got here in June, uh, he was happy to be here, but he just I, – I can't explain why. And I'm not trying to blame North Carolina. I'm just – I'm sure that was part of the problem, that he, he, he was not 
that fire wasn't burning as much as it did when I met that young man in high school. And I think he's getting there again. <coughs> he was phenomenal in practice uh, preparing for Vanderbilt. Like, he made some passes and – and 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 uh, he, he's starting to connect his his mind, his athleticism, and his skill. Uh, when he when he starts doing that on a regular basis again, he's 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 going to be real good. I'm I'm excited for him. He he uh, he seems to be really happy right now. Frank, the other day you talked uh, about you're pr pretty pleased with the progress of your freshman to this point, even saying Trey Anderson uh, has has kind of turned a corner. How often, sometimes this time of year is when your freshmen hit a wall, uh, when they hit kind of that January and the mm -hmm. conference play starts. Mm -hmm. Why do you think this group is, is maybe going that other direction? Um, because uh, we've had some redshirt freshmen that are actually dealing with that responsibility. Um, I, I just, the, the, there's a, anybody can lose. Losing's easy. All you got to do is show up. You're guaranteed you're going to lose. There's never a guarantee that you're going to win. And to win, there's a burden that comes with it. And that means a responsibility to do something a certain way every single day. Not, not just when you're in a good mood, not just when you play well every single day. Uh, there's a burden that comes with, uh, with winning, which means that whether you win or lose, you end up behind this microphone in front of you and have to answer as to why you won or why you lost, why you played well, why you didn't play well. Freshmen are not used to that. Um, I think them being shielded by some guys that have been around um, has allowed them to not have to bear that burden uh, as earlier in the year, which then has allowed them to grow at a natural rate. Um, but also, I've seen freshmen that, that haven't been able to sustain that. So that's why I wanted to make sure I mentioned that the other day because I was excited about those guys when we signed them. And now that we're in the fight, um, I'm even more excited about them because I see what they are about. The, the best thing about that group, the first year guys, because I'm not, I'm not including uh, TJ and Jermaine in this because I already had a feel for those guys, um, is they're all very humble. They, they want you to coach them. They want you to help them. They, 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 uh, they care about their team. They care about what their teammates uh, opinionate of them. Um, that, that's why I'm excited about those guys. And they're, they, they come in every single day. Uh, and they, like, I haven't put Trey Anderson in a game in a long time. I put him in at the end of the Vanderbilt game. I think I played him at A&M for a minute out of necessity, not because I wanted to. That guy doesn't pout, man. He doesn't come in here and give us a bad day. He doesn't roll his eyes. He don't stick his lower lip out. He comes in here every day and, and, and competes his tail off to try and do better. And he's doing that. I've been really hard on Trey Hannibal. I, I told Trey the other day, I said, I've been hard on you because I know how great you're going to be. And you don't want me to cheat you, do you? And he's like, no, don't change. And I said, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not to worry about this whole crusty, you know what, and I'm, I'm not going to change. And – because uh, those are all my conversations with them when I'm recruiting them. I don't recruit them and tell them how great they are. I recruit them and I ask them how great they want to be. And when they tell me, then I try to give them a walkthrough as to what it's going to take to get there, and then it's my job to help them get there, not win games. And uh, or at least that's the way I view it. And, uh, and if you do that, you end up winning games because you create a real personal connection with the guys that you're coaching. Uh, but that's, that's why... I, I mentioned what I did. Um, I think those th that group of first year guys are, are they're they're just fun. They they don't there's no pouting, there's no moping, there's no um, and I'm not trying to uh, 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 give you an indirect notice of previous guys. I'm just making a statement on these guys. No off the court issues. They don't come in here and when they don't play, they don't come in the next day and go through the motions. I don't have to get mad at them to compete. They do that on their own, and uh, that's fun to be around. Kind of sticking with that a little bit, you touched on Trey Hannibal after the, the Vanderbilt game and played mm -hmm. him a lot. And I don't want to say let him go, um, run on the point, but you, you let him play a little bit more, maybe freer. Um, what did you see from him against Vanderbilt? How have you seen him maybe progress um, since, since Christmas? 
I'm going to answer your question, but what do you mean by I let him play freer? No, that I didn't take him out of the game? No, probably that I didn't take him out of the game? Maybe because he did what I asked him to do. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you guys. But I don't care how talented you are. When you're 18 years old, you're not coming in and doing whatever you feel like doing. I didn't let Sandarius do it. You think I'm going to let him do it? I mean, you know, it doesn't make him a bad kid. It makes him a freshman. And uh, I, he did what I asked him to do. And there's two times in the game. We came out of a timeout, and I told him to go right and run a play A, and he went B and ran play tray. And he had a bad moment with me when he did that. And, you know, and, you know, and then there's another situation where we have certain rules defensively. And I, I'm not a micromanager of people. I don't like people micromanaging me, so I don't micromanage anybody. But I let everyone know, like, these things are non-negotiable. And he broke it off to kind of make the highlight play defensively. He heard from me that play again. But I thought he was really good on the ball. Uh, I thought that Jermaine worked his tail off on, um, uh, God bless, Saban Lee. And then Trey came in, and he was rock solid on Saban Lee. And I think that had something to do with wearing Saban Lee down. And Trey had a lot to do with that. I thought Trey ran our team. I thought he executed uh, what I was calling for the most part. So. If that's what you mean by I allowed him to play freer, yeah. I, I let everyone play free, but they better listen to what I say. <laughs> I mean, if they're, you know, this, this, is not, uh, this is not charity here, man. It's, you know, we, we you know, I, I expressed to the team the other day because we still have a lot of young guys, and, you know, young people think that new companies care what they think. Like, excuse me, young people think that established companies care about what they think. You don't bring 18-year-olds to listen to them. You bring in 18-year-olds to teach them. And the better they are at teach, at listening and growing, the more responsibility you give them. The more responsibility you give them, then the more important their voice becomes. But you don't bring them in and say, hey, what do you think I should do? No. <laughs> They're coming here because they think I can help them. Uh, and in exchange, they can become better. Um, and that's something that I don't know about you, Colin, but everywhere I've worked in my life, I didn't show up here until South Carolina how we're doing things. I had to adapt as to how South Carolina does things. I mean the campus and the community. And once I started to adapt, then I can start sharing my opinions on what we need to do a little bit better, in my opinion. But if I showed up from day one, I said, oh, this stinks, and the way you do this does you know what they would have told me? It's the way the world works, man. It's and, and I think Trey's grown tremendously in that respect. So it's a little freer. Anybody have a last question? Okay, thanks everybody. All right, guys.